Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to the Q4 and Fiscal 2020 Campbell Soup Company Live Q&A session. At this time, all participants' lines are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star and then one on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star and then zero. I would now like to hand the conference over to Rebecca Gardy, Vice President, Investor Relations. Ma'am, you may begin. Thank you, Operator. I hope everyone has had the chance this morning to read our press release and listen to our pre-recorded management presentation, both of which are available on the Investor Relations section of CampbellSoupCompany.com. In addition, we have posted a transcript of the pre-recorded presentation. After the conclusion of today's live Q&A session, we will post a transcript and an audio replay of this call. Please note that during today's Q&A session, we may make forward-looking statements which reflect our current expectations about our business plans, our first quarter 2021 guidance, and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on our business. These statements rely on assumptions and estimates which could be inaccurate and are subject to risk. We will also refer to certain non-GAAP measures. Please refer to today's earnings release available on the investor section of our website, campbellsoupcompany.com, for a list of factors that could cause our actual results to vary materially from those anticipated in forward-looking statements and for reconciliations of non-GAAP measures to the most directly comparable GAAP measures. Joining me today are Mark Klaus, Campbell's President and CEO, and Mick Bakehausen, Chief Financial Officer. We kindly ask that you limit yourself to one question. And with that, I'll now turn it over to the operator for the first question. Operator? Thank you. And our first question will come from Andrew Lazar from Barclays. Your line is open. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the question. Hey, Andrew. Um, you know, Mark, I know that um, fiscal 21 was sort of initially, as the way you laid it out in the, in the multi-year plan, uh, thought to be a pretty big year in terms of reframing the soup category for, for Campbell through innovation and, and other, other means. Um, and I'm trying to get a sense of, of what's maybe changed or what needs to change around the strategy for this, this soup journey, if anything, um, given recent trends, because if you think about it, you know, Campbell has picked up so many new households and users that I'm thinking the focus maybe now shifts more from, you know, retaining or, you know, to retaining users rather than maybe solely gaining new ones. So I'm just trying to get a sense of how that, if at all, changes the sort of the, the approach and the journey around soup. Yeah, no, great, great question. Um, I think, you know, the the good news is that a lot of the, you know, strategic framework of, of what we had set out to accomplish on soup, um, you know, initially was laid out in such a way where the primary goal or the objective was to improve relevance of the category and begin to add or recover households that had lost. Um, as you point out, I think the best way to describe where we are right now is that we've, you know, through the, the pandemic been able to jump forward um, on that strategic journey. And if you go back and kind of think about what did we set out to do in 20, it was really to, you know, strengthen the base, improve quality, uh, make some uh, material investments in the business to begin to reestablish or rebuild um, that relevancy, and then begin to, to build back the, the innovation funnel. Um, if you kind of think about what we then accomplished in 20, you know, really across the board, we we well went beyond what our expectations are. So as we go into 21, although I do think it is more about retaining those households, a lot of the strategies and the things that we had planned to do are things that we will continue to do, I think just with a higher degree of probability of success and a um, better set of insights on uh, what's compelling um, consumers and what's been working or not working. So. You know, a lot of, I think there's been a lot of discussion or debate about, you know, when you kind of come through all this, how do you feel about where you are in the strategic journey on soup? And that was why, to some degree, I tried to, you know, cover in the remarks that, you know, this to me on soup is a little bit less about peaks and valleys as we think about how to, to manage through this short term, but really that steady progress that enables us to come out of this tunnel in a position where soup is a steady contributor to the business. Because if you go back to the thesis of the company, if you're able to accomplish that in conjunction 
with what we believe we can do on snacking and even the balance of the meals and beverage business, it really does position us in a, position us in a very advantaged way. So as we get into 21, I think the, you know, one of the things I'll just leave you with is, you know, a lot of, uh, I guess, powder is still dry in the strategy when it comes to innovation, shelving, uh, many of the things that we had planned in 21. And so I get, you know, I think, as I said in my comments, I'm building confidence because you still have those elements to layer on top uh, of what, you know, kind of the shorter term boost has been. And I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more of the consumer trends, but, you know, we've done a lot of work on this behavior of increased cooking and uh, quick scratch cooking in particular. And we've built now a series of insights that give us a lot more confidence uh, that this is going to sustain beyond just a pandemic period. And I'm sure that'll come up a little bit later and, and we can talk more about it. But I, I think the net of it is um, a lot of the same activities. It's just we're further down the road than we expected. We keep staying that course. I think, if anything, this is building a lot more confidence uh, in our ability to make soup a steady contributor. Great. Thanks so much for their perspective. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ken Goldman from J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Hi, good morning, and thank you. Um, okay. Hey, Mark, you said that um, the operating environment is creating opportunities, uh, I think, to evaluate future efficiencies as you, as you learn from COVID. Can you maybe elaborate on what that means, how big the opportunity might be? I, I know it's hard to know for sure right now, but you know, a lot of your peers have discussed this uh, in sort of, you know, rough terms. Maybe some travel costs can be reduced. I'm just trying to get a sense from you yeah. of, of what you're seeing and, and the size of that if possible. Yeah. So, I, you know, it, you're right. It's, it's hard to, you know, to quantify. I think what the way I would describe it is it's creating drill sites for us for future productivity. And, and that's, I think, you know, quite helpful um, because we've, we've been able to create this kind of, you know, I'd, I'd say real-world um, case studies and, and laboratory to test a few things. I think there's three primary areas, though, that, that we see as, as future opportunity. Um, I think the first is in optimizing the portfolio, right? So where are we over-skewed, under-skewed? Where are we really getting incrementality um, from certain extensions of our portfolio? You know, how do we really think about optimizing the effectiveness uh, of, our, of our offerings to really match where consumers, um, our needs are, and, and to create room for what we think is going to be meaningful innovation um, while setting up a, a more efficient overall uh, approach to the, to the portfolio. I think the second area is, as we've seen kind of full utilization um, across our entire supply chain and route to market, um, I think it's enabled us to understand some places, you know, almost out of necessity in the short term that we've done, um, that we think in the longer term, our ability to create certain consolidations, how to think about um, uh, perhaps hubs to supply in a, in a more efficient way, especially as you think about our snacks business, um, where you've got a little bit more complicated route to market. Um, I think we've, we've been able to find even if it's in the face of some higher costs than this year, but it's pointed out places where if we can improve um, that uh, architecture structure, uh, you know, I, I see opportunity to, to save money. And then the third, where I think a lot of people have spent time talking, is how do you, you know, learn from this virtual work environment uh, ways to operate companies more efficiency, you know, efficiently? Do you need as much travel? Do you need um, quite the infrastructure that you might have? Can you figure out a way um, to take what has been working very effectively for the company um, and use that as a little bit of a blueprint. I, I do very much still believe that the concept of team environments um, is important for businesses like ours. A lot of, a lot of the innovation and creativity um, is done through you know, cross-functional collaboration, and although we've done a great job uh, with that virtually, um, and al although I think it can enable and unlock some potential efficiency and savings going forward, I think at the heart of the company, I, I still believe that there's real value um, in, in folks being able to sit face to face and across the table to work on things. But I think the, the good news is all three of those 
um, we're beginning to mine as opportunities going forward, and I think that's going to help strengthen uh, our pipeline of, of savings, especially as we're coming to the end of our enterprise uh, savings program. As we've talked about, uh, we're wrapping up, you know, here the um, – you know, the, the value capture from the Snyder's Lance integration. And so it's just great to see some, some new ideas uh, that are beginning to populate that uh, pipeline. So, you know, good thing coming out of a tough situation. Thanks so much. Yep. Thank you. Our next question comes from Nick Motti from RBC Capital Market. Your line is open. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, hey, Nick. So, Mark, uh, hey, Mark, I just wanted to revisit the discussion on, on these new households. So, you know, it's going to obviously be an important part of how your growth curve looks over the next couple of quarters and, and the next couple of years. So can you just talk about the composition of these new households yep. and how they might differ from kind of what you were seeing pre-COVID? And so I'll just give you an example. Some of the data we've reviewed would suggest new Prego consumers are younger singles, spend higher online than average, skew to vegan and vegetarians and tend to dine out two to, t two to five times a week. So I'm just curious if this is consistent with what you've been observing in, in your data. Yeah, it's very consistent. So we would see essentially in the households we've added, just shy of 50% of those new households are coming from younger um, consumers. It's a combination of different size households, you know, can be a little bit older millennials who are now just beginning young families. Um, you know, working, you know, with a little bit of a different uh, budget perhaps than they did when they were younger, um, as well as um, some much smaller households. And, and I think, you know, as we think about this going forward, those become, as you would imagine, a very, very high priority for us. And, you know, one of the great things about Q4, and, and I know, um, you know, even coming out of Q3, I, was, I had a lot of questions about, okay, you know, even as you're navigating some of the supply pressure, you continue to invest at a very high level, um, and, and I think that was incredibly valuable for us in the fourth quarter, and it really proved some, some terrific learnings and results. You know, one of the things um, that I think, you know, harder to see in the numbers in Q4, um, but if you take e-commerce as an example where we know there's a, uh, a higher index to where these particular younger consumers are shopping and gaining information, 86% of our spending on our meals and beverage business in the fourth quarter was on digital to support this through a combination of retailers' platforms uh, as well as a, a whole range of different tactics to really try to understand what works and what doesn't. So as we go into this year, we're going to be more effective. But what we found is we can, we can have a big impact um, with that population. Our, our e-commerce business uh, was up over 100%. Um, in the fourth quarter, it now represents for us as a company, it essentially doubled uh, in 2020. It was kind of low single digits. Now it's up into the uh, mid single digits. And again, as you think about our ability to demonstrate growth there, which, you know, again, doesn't really show up as much in your uh, uh, measured channels, it, it creates a really great platform for us to connect to consumers um, in, in, a very, uh, in a very specific way to influence them. And I think one of the things that I'll just mention too with this particular target that's giving us a lot of confidence beyond just the online uh, success that we had is this um, dynamic around cooking and quick scratch cooking. And, you know, I think for a lot of people, and myself included, I wanted to try to understand a little better behaviorally what's going on so we can better predict what's going to happen after the pandemic. And, you know, does that give us a higher likelihood of keeping those consumers in the franchise, right? I think that's the big question. And we found a couple very specific things that I think are giving us a lot of confidence. The first is um, that, you know, the, the initial read through of what was going on in this cooking was a lot of consumers trying to recreate favorite meals, comfort food, you know, feeling out of necessity having to cook, but, but staying pretty close to home. I think what we've seen as time goes on and as confidence is building, you know, think about cooking, you know, three meals a day, seven days a week for a couple months. The amount of confidence these consumers have now in their ability to cook has really broadened their ability to add significant creativity, um, which is allowing them to reach into, into dishes and food that is far more, I think, sustainable longer term, right? Where for me, it might be, you know, 15 minute chicken and rice for these consumers, it's, you know, Tuscan chicken and mushroom on rice cauliflower, 
using still our ingredients, but doing it for a meal that, that feels uh, far more consistent with where they're going. And the other exciting thing is that we all knew that there would be a pivot eventually back to healthier uh, recipes. Again, a little more comfort oriented initially, a little more healthier now, and, and our products are staying right in there. You know, with the combination of what we offer with Pacific, um, uh, the recognition that a lot of the quality improvements and some of those historical barriers to the can uh, that we really have been working on to overcome, I think we're seeing great indication that we're moving through it. And then the final one is, is value. And I think what we're realizing and what consumers are realizing is that that value equation on this quick scratch cooking is quite powerful. So you roll that all together, you know, our ability to impact consumers online as well as the strengthening conviction to cooking, move, quick scratch cooking moving forward gives me a lot more confidence. And I think you heard that in my comments earlier on our ability to retain these households and in particular retaining these households on soup, uh, which I think is going to be a very important milestone or, or, or uh, indicator or proof point uh, as we go forward on whether we're able to sustain uh, more of this in the starting in the back half, but certainly going forward. Helpful, Super helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jason English from Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, folks. Hey, Jason. Thank, thank you for slotting me in. Um, two, two reasonably straightforward questions. Um, first, in the press release, you mentioned some gains on commodity hedges. Uh, you explained to effectively account for the majority of corporate cost decrease, which implies like 37 million. But in the uh, in the presentation, you say it only partially offset the commodity inflation, which suggests less than 15 million. Um, so, first question: What is the magnitude of that? Um, uh, second question: I'm going to just bundle these together. Um, uh, net pricing: uh, It was surprising to see that you know, your trade spend still up uh, year on year, and promos a net drag on sales. Um, it, it's, it's surprising context what's happening in the promotional environment overall. So, so two parts to that question. One, where's the money going? Two, as we think forward, we're hearing from pretty much every company that um, they're expecting promotions to kind of come back into the market and, and become more elevated going forward. Do you expect that to happen as well? And given that it's already a net negative, would you expect that net drag to increase as we go forward? Thank you. Yeah, okay, why don't I take the first one, Jason? So uh, with regard to your first question, to clarify the mark-to-market uh, -market gains on commodity hedges, it's in and around 20 million. Got it, thank you. Yeah, on, on, the, um, on the promotional, um, you know, what we're seeing promotionally and as, as, as pricing, I mean, we, we have, and framed it a little bit as a relatively neutral uh, position um, in the quarter. Um, you know, I think our net pricing as a contributor within our um, gross margin bridge was, a, was essentially flat. There's a couple things that are, that are underlying that. We are seeing, um, in, especially in categories where there is more pressure on supply, um, some pullback in, in promotion. I think one of the things we're trying to wrestle with a little bit through all this is, okay, you know, if I promote the if I promote the business with retailers, you know, I may drive a growth rate of 10 or 15 percent. Um, I can supply maybe five or six percent growth, and then if I don't promote, <laughs> I only grow two. Right. So we're we're trying to to figure out how to calibrate the right kind of promotion and support to get to the best position possible. I do expect as we go through uh, 21, that's going to moderate um, and return to more normality. I think it'll be a little choppier. Uh, in the first quarter, but as we start to get into soup season and beyond, um, I think you'll see a much more uh, consistent uh, promotional calendar and schedule uh, as, as we ad advance. I think in the near term, what you are seeing, though, is in the absence of some of those, um, and, and as we shift mix to things where we may have more supply um, and better position, I think you're seeing us continue to promote uh, fairly aggressively, and, and again, I think we're working very collaboratively um, with the retailers to try to make sure, too, that if you're a, you know, I mentioned this last time, if you're a high-low um, retailer versus an EDLP retailer and you're pulling back on promotions, you know, it, it does create a little bit more of a disadvantage in certain customers, 
and we're trying to work hard to make sure that, that you know, we're equitable in our approach and that we're supporting uh, customers to navigate through that in the best way possible. So there's a little bit of mix uh, that may be uh, that may be elevating as well. I think you know, from my perspective, though, I, I think you know how I would have depicted it is relatively neutral, um, with a with a trajectory to increase as we go into 21. Mick, anything to add on the you know kind of the financial bridge side of it? No, I, I agree with that. I think that's pricing in the end. I mean, as you also see in one of our bridges in the materials was actually net neutral. Yeah. Got it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question comes from Chris Gurley from People. The line is open. Hi, good morning. Hey, Chris. Hi, I just, I had a question for you. I heard about some supply chain challenges in certain parts of your business and at the same time, an ability to ship out of consumption in some other areas, I'm thinking like in, like in soup. So I want to get a, a better sense if I could about your production capabilities. Um, especially the areas in which you're investing to improve your supply chain. And then yeah. just to get a sense around retail inventories, or, you know, are there still some areas you have to build up or, they, you know, kind of where you stand on retail inventories overall? Yeah, uh, great. Great question. So, so let me kind of chunk that into the, into the three pieces you kind of asked. First, as far as the supply chain capability and our execution, um, you know, I, I feel great about how the team has, has shown up. You know, a, a lot – um, of discussion in the Q3 earnings call, and as we kind of guided the Q4, um, the you know the real improvement or the uptick in what we guided to, to where we landed um, was improvement in capacity as it related to soup, which enabled us um, to replenish inventory at a higher level, which was our goal. Um, not fully complete yet. I think you'll continue to see that going forward. But just on the basis of uh, of when I talk about supply chain challenges. These are not executional challenges. This is not us performing. This is not, you know, COVID-related impact. This is simply the sustained level of demand in certain businesses uh, where we may have a little less flexibility um, to be able to, you know, kind of, you know, move to that higher level. So first off, that's that's kind of the starting point. I think what you're seeing in this quarter is some um, variation between businesses, right? If we were in Q3, we were talking a little bit about the depletion of inventory on soup. I think the great news um, in Q4 is we were able to replenish in many areas. One of the dynamics that's happening is you'll see uh, throughout um, uh, the Q1 is the return of the vast majority of the SKUs uh, that we had removed. That there will be some that we choose not to come back with that we think are just good business decisions, um, but that pipeline still remains. And I would still expect to see um, an ability to ship ahead of consumption uh, as it relates to soup um, as we go through the, the first quarter. And again, you know, our guidance implies a certain limitation there. We're going to continue to work on improving that capacity as we go forward uh, to hopefully, you know, more broaden. Uh, that ability and, and ensure, but at the end, we feel good that we'll be there by the time we get to uh, soup season. Um, I think what you saw on the other side of the equation was some pressure on businesses across um, snacks. Uh, in particular, I think the two that right now um, are, are probably our areas of biggest focus is our uh, potato chip businesses, our Kettle and Cape Cod. Um, you know, the good news is we've got a great plan in place, which is really to your third point on adding capacity, but there's certainly been pressure there. We've also seen some pressure on supplying Lance, um, our sandwich cracker business. And on uh, Goldfish, I think we're in great shape on supply. We've opened the new line at Willard. A little bit of what we're navigating on Goldfish is trying to figure out, again, that mix uh, as we go through back to school on whether it's bulk or individual packs, and we continue to see uh, demand remaining very, very high on the bulk side. But I think generally speaking, we feel good about that. So there are a little bit of improvements on one, opportunities on other, but as we come through the end of the first quarter, we really expect to be back across the board, um, and, and we are making major investments um, in, in many of the areas where we have great confidence in the sustainability of the demand going forward. So places like Goldfish, places like Milano, places like Kettle Chips, um, places like Broth on our business, all of those are getting investments 
and uh, we need them, um, but they're, they're, I think, going to be uh, helping us uh, in a pretty significant way as we get into the, uh, into the second quarter. So, you know, again, I, I think that's a little bit of the nature of the guidance in Q1, and again, we would hope that we can create you know, further upside there that, that, uh, that could be opportunity, but for where we are right now, again, we're trying to be as uh, pragmatic as we can be. That was very good color. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Robert Moscow from Credit Suisse. Your line is open. Hi, thanks. Um, hey, two Rob. quick ones. Uh, it, the, the sales guidance for 1Q, do you expect in total to ship to consumption in, in 1Q, or does that include you know, some, some degree of shipping above consumption in that range? Uh, and secondarily, I think you quantified last quarter exactly how much inventory you needed to reload. I think the number was like $200 million. Maybe you can give us an update on that. Um, and, and last thing, um, there was a lot of margin compression in snacks. I think you attributed to the, the ANC investment in the quarter. Uh, but you also talked about COVID costs really hitting snacks harder. So, so why is there margin compression in snacks uh, related to COVID, but in soup, uh, the, the margins are actually going higher. Um, is it just different businesses in terms of how they, the COVID costs run through them? Yeah. So, so let me let me uh, uh, first, you know, talk a little bit about inventory again and what we expect in Q1. So, <clears throat> you have a couple things that are going on in in, in Q1 that I think are important um, for for people to you know try to calibrate on, and I, I know. You know, you're coming out of a, a quarter where your, you know, organic growth is 12%. Um, seeing a guide of five to seven may feel to some a little bit like, okay, well, that's not, you know, why aren't we just running at the rate going forward? I think there's a couple variables in there, and then I'll answer, and then on the tail end, I'll catch your uh, inventory piece. Um, the first thing is that we we do expect demand, consumption demand, to be elevated, especially on the meals and beverage side. But one thing that is worth noting is it's a significantly bigger base in the first quarter. So although I do think growth will be there, I, I just think the absolute numbers are going to be a little bit moderated um, from where we are. Right now, what we have planned is to continue to recover some inventory on the meals and beverage side. But to be honest, we're pushing the team hard to try to create room to, to uh, um, recover even more. I would say from a total inventory recovery, a position across the company, we're probably about halfway done. So I still think further ahead on soup, not as far ahead on some of the other businesses. So I would still expect there to be over the course of Q1. Some may even bleed a little bit into Q2, um, but I, I'm still expecting about half of that, Rob, uh, to come back over the uh, over the first half, primarily Q1, but over the first half of the year. And again, a lot of this is going to boil down to how much capacity we're able to uh, generate. So certainly we hope we're going to push above that. Snacks is a little bit different, right? I think snacks, what we're seeing is a, is a although elevated level of demand in some areas, a more return to normality um, in others, which, by the way, I still believe is going to be healthy growth and, you know, continuing to make great progress. But, you know, for example, we're in the midst right now of back to school, um, and it's, it's been very interesting to watch the first couple weeks of that, where you see, uh, on the one hand, um, a, a significant increase in our uh, demand for soup for quick lunches as well as bulk on our snack business, but we definitely see uh, a reduction in, in some of the more traditional back-to-school uh, portion packs. So, you know, I think as we navigate that, we're, we're trying to, to calibrate to the right uh, numbers. You know, I, I, I will just say, as I said in my comment, um, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a complicated time to give people a tremendous sense of precision in the numbers, but I think the general drivers we feel very good about, it's now our ability to match the magnitude. So still a lot of inventory to go. I think healthy demand underlying it, and, and we would expect that to continue through the first half. Um, and so that's kind of how we've uh, initially set up these numbers in the first quarter. 
Oh, yeah. yeah. And about the, uh, the margin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On COVID costs, maybe just a little bit wide stacks is different than. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. Numbers. So let me give you a little bit of context around the COVID cost. We had about 25 million of COVID costs in Q3. If you look at Q4, because Q3 was obviously only half impacted by COVID, Q4, we had a full quarter. The overall costs were double that, give or take about 50 million. If you look at the uh, distribution between the two divisions, you see that about two-thirds of that hit snacks, which is really, really driven by the nature of the manufacturing footprint of the snacks division, i.e., we have many more facilities, obviously, there. Then the other piece, so on the one hand, you had more COVID costs in snacks than we had in meals and beverages. And the other piece that I saw kind of looking through the quarter we had increased operating leverage disproportionately within the M&B business, driven by obviously much more volume than what we saw on the snack side. So yeah. hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense of the dynamic there. Yeah, and, and just wrap a little more color as you go then into the, into the uh, first quarter and into 21, you know, we, we essentially are, are modeling those COVID costs to be 50% or closer to Q3, I think. Yeah, what we basically said. more in line with yeah, right. more in line with I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And we'll take our last question from John Baumgartner from Wells Fargo. Your line is open. Good morning. Thanks for the question. Hey, John. Mark, you know, I just wanted to build on, on Jason's question in that you know, the, the Snyder's Lance brands, I mean, those tended to overpromote relative to their categories in the past. And, you know, given the continued reductions in promo we're seeing in conjunction with, I guess, limited moderation and base volume growth into Q1, um, I guess I'm curious, A, how do you feel about the ability to use this environment to sort of wean consumers off at higher promo, especially if you're getting higher ROI on the marketing dollars? And then B, um, to what extent do you see the environment offering opportunities to maybe accelerate any sort of increase in the share of your own brands um, as opposed to the allied or partner brands? Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, you know, as I've said uh, a couple times before, I think what's unique about our snacks business is the differentiated position uh, that we're in, um, in the sense that we tend to play in a little more added value segments within larger categories. And I think that that does um, position us uh, to be in a position where we should be less dependent uh, on merchandising and promotion. I think the reality is, though, on something, for example, uh, like Snyder's Hanover in the pretzel business, it's a very competitive segment, as it is in kettle chips right now as well. So I think, you know, one of the things we learned last year, if you remember, turning back the clock to actually all the way back to 19, you know, our ability to um, get to the, the right price points on promotion, just given the nature of snacking, the right level of frequency, will always be an important underpinning to execution in snacks. But I think that if you pair that then with where we've really been building added value as it relates to the equity of the businesses, as we've turned campaigns back on, especially on the Snyder's uh, businesses, we've been able to see uh, continued progress. Let me, you know, point to late July as a great example. First national campaign um, that we've ever uh, turned on or had on on the business. Um, we turned that on in the, you know, in the fourth quarter. You know, that business grew 30 uh, percent on a 52-week basis and, a, and share gains of over a point in a fairly um, contested tortilla chip segment. But because of the premium positioning uh, relative to late July, great communication. We could do that in a way where we were able to uh, achieve that without necessarily having to drop down into the price points that you know more mainstream players have. So that's the balancing act we're we're trying to walk. And I think if we get that formula right, as we have on uh, brands like you know Milano and Farmhouse and uh, on Pepperidge Farm, even Goldfish, although that one's you know again you you've you've got a, a very habitual uh, program calendar for Goldfish that when we see. When that deviates, that does put pressure on the business. But as we get back into normality on that, uh, as we roll through the year, um, you know, I think most of these businesses were going to be able to do uh, trade in a more efficient way than perhaps history. But we still got to have enough there that we remain competitive on display um, and, and making sure that, that we recognize what's happening around us competitively. 
Thanks, Mark. Much appreciated. Thank you. And that does conclude our question and answer session for today's conference. And I'd like to turn the conference back over to Mark Klaus for any closing remarks. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining. I, you know, I hope you're, um, you know, appreciating uh, the new format. I think we will kind of stick with this where we try to publish um, our comments earlier and, and give people a chance to kind of digest and read through and then, you know, focus our time together, um, you know, in Q&A when, uh, when we're on the call. Um, I know there's a lot to digest in this. Uh, I know it's a tricky time too. You know, we, we've certainly tried to build um, it is much uh, conviction and I guess credibility and, and being as transparent as we can to give the information as we get it and give perspective. Of course, that always uh, creates a little bit of a, of a dynamic that, uh, um, you know, we, we need to make sure that we're updating it as we go and we will. I think um, as we navigate this year, we'll try to make sure that as we see things change or as, you know, capacity or demand moves, we'll, we'll be as, uh, up front as possible. I don't know that that translates, and I, I don't think it will to quarterly guidance each time, um, but we'll certainly try to keep everybody as informed as we can be. And I, I just would close with, with something that I talked about, um, you know, in, the, in my comments, which is, you know, if you, take back, if you take a step back and you take stock of where the company is right now and you say, okay, you know, where a year ago, where were we expecting to be? And, you know, how, how do we feel about navigating this kind of moment in time? Um, I have to say that across the board strategically, I see tremendous benefit that we've been able to extract from a tough moment. And I think that that is going to set us up very well for the future. And if I think about, again, not perhaps the peaks and the valleys of the near term, but the longer term view of what the, the thesis of the company is, I have just built significantly more confidence. And I think as you see our two-year uh, stack numbers together, um, I think that's going to provide further evidence of our progress um, against where you know, we originally set out. And I think in particular, what we've talked about on soup and the conviction around soup um, to, to be not only what we needed it to be, which was a stable player, but with the potential for it to be uh, a more uh, steady contributor, um, along with great progress on our snacks business, again, I think gives us the benefit of being a very focused portfolio, a very straightforward strategy, and now with a, with a great deal more proof points uh, of our ability to sustain performance going forward. So hopefully that helps give you a little bit of perspective. I know we mixed a bit of investor day stuff uh, along with earnings into today, but I thought it was a good moment uh, to try to talk a little bit about where we are in that strategic journey, because I know it's top of mind uh, for many of your investors. So appreciate everybody's time and questions. I know we'll talk to many later uh, today, and, and we'll try to make sure you, you, you've got everything that you need uh, to put the results in context and the guidance going forward. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation, and you may now disconnect. Everyone, have a wonderful day.